Um, we're going to look at God's Word. And we're looking at Daniel, aren't we? Yes. We're looking at Daniel. Oh, by the way, in case you wondered where I was, where I was last week, I was in um, Winchmore Hill. Sebastian was saying, you weren't here last week, Pastor. I said, I know. <laughs> I was preaching at Winchmore Hill Baptist Church. They were celebrated an anniversary there, and they asked whether I would be their visiting preacher. So I was, uh, I was preaching over there on Sunday. And that was fun. They started at half past ten. I had to remember. That's a traditional Baptist time to start, half past ten. Well, it was 11 o'clock Malarkey. Oh, yeah. 11 o'clock is not the norm. You didn't know that, did you? Well, you, all your life has been in Barnett Baptist Church. <laughs> All right, are we ready? We're all thinking, what's the matter with him this morning? I don't know, it's because I'm off on holiday tomorrow. I'm D-mob happy or something. Daniel chapter 3, the first seven verses. <clears throat> King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, uh, 90 feet high and 9 feet wide, and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, Prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satrap prefects, all that lot, came <laughs> uh, and uh, they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, this is what you are commanded to do. O peoples, nations, and men of every language. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, and all the kinds of music, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold the king Nebuchadnezzar had set up. I'm going to pick up the story uh, at verse uh, 12 because it, it repeats um, that stuff. Um, so at verse 12, a complaint came. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, O king. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach? Meshach, Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up. Now when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all the kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious. This man seems to be living in a constant rage. He was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of his strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, and turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. 
The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet uh, in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, O king. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. And the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was the hair of their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble for no other God can save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the provinces of Babylon. Of course, it's a story we all know so well from uh, Sunday school days, don't we? Um, this morning, I really was tempted uh, not to preach. Um, I had a busy week, incredibly busy week. I was feeling tired. And I thought, am I going to write a sermon this week, or am I going to ask the church to preach this sermon? But this is a story you know inside out. I'm thinking... You don't need me to tell you what the story says. So you can tell us how we live accordingly. And then I thought, you know something? I may not be successful, so I think I'll write a sermon. So I chickened out last minute. So I went and wrote a sermon. Did I get that right? Or would you prefer to talk about it? Aha, uh -huh. I'm bouncing it back to you now like a boomerang. Did I get that right or did I get it wrong? Yeah, I probably got it right. <laughs> 13 years have been trying to encourage you to be all psh, 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 psh. hasn't quite worked has it I'll keep on trying keep on trying I've entitled this the God we serve is able to save just quoting part of that uh, passage you just read it has been said that one of the big dangers if not one of the biggest dangers to the church is not secularism outside without because that's what we all complain about the fact that the world has become so secular and it has but the biggest danger is not what's happening out there it's what's happening in here because in here we have a people who have a lack of conviction so the biggest danger to the church is not the secular secularism happening outside it's the lack of conviction inside. It has been observed. What is needed is Christians to stand up for what is right. In other words, Christians to stand up for what is right. Christians to be people of conviction and integrity. I've put a quote up there, which I have used this quote three or four times before. It won't be new to you, but it was still relevant and pertinent for this morning. Christians to be people of conviction and integrity. Christians to be people who stay faithful to God. Whatever is happening out there, let it happen. What matters more than anything else is what happens in here. How faithful are we to God? Because as people of conviction... Uh, we will then take that out there and then we will be salt. You get it? And we will be light. You get it? 
But if you sit here and there's no conviction, you think, oh, let Rupert blow hot for 30 minutes and then we'll have a coffee and go home then. Oh, well. What's needed is the conviction in him. I'm harassing you this morning, aren't I? Hey, hey that's, that's a preacher's a job. job. That's a preacher's that's job. That's what God has called me to do. The pressure to conform, the pressure to compromise is everywhere. I don't know about you. We are being constantly bombarded with the pressure to conform, the pressure to compromise constantly. Constantly. The world constantly presses in on every side. And it kind of like nibbles away like a piranha. You know those piranha fishes? They just nibble away and before you know what, they eat away everything. Just nibbles away, nibbling away. The world just nibbles away and it gets us to compromise a bit here and a bit there. And before you know what, we are no different from anybody else. Absolutely no different. Nobody can tell the difference. We work with people for 20 years and then they say, oh, I didn't know you were a Christian. Well, hang on, the light didn't shine at all, did it? Where, where's the, the, how could people not know? Things that we're so assimilated, we're so similar in our behavior, we're so well camouflaged that we're not seen. The pressure to belong, for example, leads us to do things and to say things to our peers. And you know, when we do things and say things to our peers because we have a pressure to belong, what happens is that as we go beyond those boundaries, a little piece of us dies inside. Or the boss instructs us to do something. Yes, we know it's our job, but it's something which is a little bit dodgy, a little bit unethical, but we do it because it's our job. And you know what happens? A little piece of us dies on the inside. I could go on naming lots of examples like that, but I won't because I think you get the point I'm trying to make. And I'm watching the clock this morning. I'm trying to wake up. I think you get the point I'm trying to make. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were teenagers to remind ourselves. They were teenagers, and this story tells us that they were teenagers with integrity and conviction. If nothing else, that's the reason why we're talking about that this morning. That's the reason why we've sung the songs that we've sung. It's just the way it touched my spirit as I was preparing and reading the scripture. You gather, you can see, you can make the connection with the songs now, can't you? Can you? Or was it just me? Ife, can you make the connections? You can. If Ife can, everybody can. <laughs> uh, we remind ourselves that together with Daniel, many of the elite Jews, they were taken by force by the superpower um, Babylon, and they were taken captivity, and they're in this strange land, they're in a foreign culture, uh, and a lot of things are just not, well, not the way they know it or even possibly like it. Um, they're made to learn new languages. Uh, they're forced to worship uh, different gods. They're among a people who seem determined, I think, to remove every bit of their Jewishness. However, chapter 1 and verse 8 tells us when it came to the royal food, for example, that Daniel and the others resolved not to defile themselves with the royal food. They knew it was wrong, so they weren't going to do it. And now we are 15, 20 years or so later, commentators believe, um, as they've looked at this story. And Daniel seems to be away. Maybe he's away on king's business, but at the moment, all we're talking is about Chadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. No Daniel, so he's out of the picture. He's He's gone, I don't know, he's gone to New Barnet on a visit or something representing the king. And he was going to come back to East Barnet, as it were. So he's away. And they have decided to make another stand. And this time it's to do with worship. This time it's to do with the allegiance of their heart. 
This time is to do with the fact that they were not prepared to surrender to any other God. Exodus chapter 20, the Ten Commandments. We know so well. It makes it clear that God is a jealous God and that uh, God's desire is that his people do not worship any other gods, any idols. Do you know, throughout Scripture, the big issue God has had is to do with idolatry. To do with idolatry. How quickly we chase after idols, after other gods. How very quickly. And of course, living in a pluralistic society, it was a pluralistic society then, back in Babylon. They had many gods. Um, many gods. That's one of the biggest issues God has had to deal with down through the years. Idolatry is sin. Idolatry is wrong. Worship of any idol breaks God's heart. He made us for himself. And he loves us. And he sent his son Jesus to die for us, to reconcile us unto himself. We belong to him. I mean, he's such a beautiful father. He's not possessive in the sense that he made it impossible, impossible for us to misbehave because he gave us free will. He says, I really want you to choose me. And he gave us free will that we may choose him. You know, he didn't make us robots or automatons and in this age of AI and all the kind of stuff that we hear in these days. He didn't make us any of that kind of stuff. He made us humans with a mind and free will. He says, I love you. Now I want you to fall in love with me. Now all of you would know that. Those of us who are parents here would know that. We want our children to love us. Uh, not because we buy them gifts or whatever. Just because they love us. Because we mom and dad. And they love us. They freely choose to love us. We don't want them to love us just because we make it impossible for them to like anybody else. We want them to freely say, no, there's all a whole raft of things to choose from. Mom, Dad, I choose you because you're beautiful. I love you. God gives us free will. So for these three teenagers, there was a red line when it came to their worship life. They were prepared to be flexible in this alien culture. But when it came to worshiping their God, that they would not compromise on. They decided that that's one step too far. They're not going to go there. They stayed true to God. And they stayed true to God knowing of the danger to their lives. They were going to be killed for this. If they didn't get down and worship this big edifice that Nebuchadnezzar built, this gold and stuff, which probably wasn't fully gold. It probably was built of wood with a gold kind of covering. Um, so it wouldn't be too much to be fully gold. But they were never going to do that. They'd probably be killed if they didn't do it. But they were not prepared uh, to do it. They would die for us. Now you understand what I mean about conviction. It has been said that the 20th century has seen more martyrs for the Christian cause than any other. Um, it has been said, the 20th century. It's interesting. Are you prepared to die for Jesus? It's an incredible question to ask. I don't, I, I'll ask myself. Am I prepared to die for Jesus? Am I prepared to lay my life down because I'm absolutely convicted of the truth and live in the truth, live in a life worthy of the calling? Am I prepared to? Friends, the price of integrity is high. And the price of integrity for these three guys was very, very high. It reminds me of Jesus' command to daily take up our cross and to follow him. Uh, he also said in Luke 14, verse 27, listen to this. Anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. These are the words of Jesus. You know what picking up your cross means. When you pick up a cross, you're heading in one direction. There's no return ticket. 
When you pick up a cross, it is something you will die on. There is no return. Jesus says, you cannot be my disciple if you are not prepared to pick up your cross daily and follow me. The words of Jesus, not mine. I am just reinforcing. For these three, it would seem that their devotion to God, which had led to their promotion, may have caused some jealousy. Uh, verse 8, we see that there's some people telling stories on them, or they went to tell the king. So it looks as if there was some jealousy there. You know, these, these foreigners who are coming and taking all the job. Does that sound familiar? It does, doesn't it? Some jealousy. And then, verse 13 speaks of the anger. I commented on it at the time. Uh, the anger and the rage for the king. Uh, verse 15 speaks of the pressure on them. Can you imagine the pressure on them when the king comes to them personally and he says to these three guys, okay, the music has stopped. You guys are not bowing down. I'm telling you something. When that music starts again, you'd better. And everybody is looking, what will they do? What will they do? Can you imagine the pressure on them? Am I too vivid in my imagination here? Can you imagine the pressure on these three guys? Because any minute now, that orchestra, if it's going to start playing any minute now, what's going to happen? The pressure, the price of integrity is high. The threats of fire. The dismissal of their God. Because King said, you know, what God with a small g? What God could ever withstand any of this? Sarcastic uh, dismissal of Yahweh, God the Almighty, amongst all other gods. The price of integrity was high. But here's the good news. Scripture tells us that uh, uh, they were, um, they entrusted themselves into God's hands. They knew that God could save them. So they entrusted themselves to his hands. Come what may. Come what may. They said, we're going to trust God. And what I love about this part of the story is that they were open to God's supernatural intervention, but they were not necessarily insisting on it. God can do it. We, I know that. He is able. He is powerful. He's almighty. He's the one who spoke and it came into being. This God is able to save us. But I tell you something. Even if he chooses not to, I ain't going to bow before that monster of yours. I don't care. I ain't going to do it. What I also love about this is that they love God simply because of who he is, not because of what they hope to get from him. Can you see that? They didn't know he was going to save them. I know we know the end of the story, and I know in the end of the story he saved them, but they had no way of knowing that going in. And they said, we don't know, but we still don't care. Because this is our God, and this is where we've drawn the line. We will not worship your God. Our heart only goes to him. Our allegiance only goes to Yahweh, God the Almighty. And never to this big thing of gold that you've erected here. Their faith rooted in God for who he is and not in what this God can do for them. We need to be Christians like that. So many of us, when God doesn't do it, uh, we fall apart, we complain. I know Christians who have given up becoming, being a Christian because God didn't do what they've asked God to do. And they've walked away. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abed Abednego stood up for what is right, and they left their faith in God's hands. They said, this we know is right, this you've declared in your word, you're a jealous God, idolatry is wrong, it is sin, I will face the consequences, my faith is in your hands, I'm going to stand up for the truth and for what's right. 
We need Christians of conviction in the church today. The problem with us in our society is not all what is going on outside. Oh, that's problematic enough. But it's whether we have the conviction on the inside, the people of God, to go and be salt and light and make that difference in the community. Remember, it always was this way. When God elected and he called his people Israel and he set them apart, it was always so that they would be a light to the nations. It was always that way. It was always that they would be an example to the nations. It was always that they would make God known to the nation a different way. Not go outside and follow everybody out there. It was always that way. And the big problem God had with his people Israel is that they never lived up to it. They went out there and wanted to be like everybody else. And we are not much different. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they did not doubt God's ability. But equally, they did not presume to know God's will. I think this is so important. Um, trust in God does not presume that God will intervene in the way we hope. <laughs> in our secular, pluralistic uh, society, uh, society with many religions and all that kind of stuff, um, we too face subtle seduction, but blatant pressures as well to compromise. Sometimes it's subtle. Sometimes it's subtle. We have learned, um, we have had to learn to become subtle as a society in some of the things that we do. Because things like being PC and all of that has forced us to go about things somewhat differently. So we learned a different way. We've adapted. Um, when it comes to things like race, for example, we've learned to be subtle. No longer the blatant racism. When it comes to things like justice, we've learned to be subtle, a lack of justice. And these things still matter to God. And sometimes it's subtle, the subtle seduction, sometimes it's blatant, and we are under pressure to comp comp com uh, compromise. Sorry. Uh, one commentator said this, and I like it. It says, which is why I'm quoting it. <laughs> Christians have to know, have to remember who they are by remembering whose they are. Remember who you are by remembering whose you are. Remember we began by re reading Psalm 100? We belong to the Lord. Remember we've been singing? We belong to the Lord. Trying to reinforce that message. We belong to the Lord. That's who we are. We belong to God. Jesus paid the price that we, the guilty ones, may go free is one of the songs that we sing. Such is God's amazing love. We belong to God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were prepared to defy a king's law that they may obey God, which reminded me of Acts chapter 5, verse 29. Um, and um, Peter and the other the apostles, uh, when they were under persecution, they said these words, we must obey God rather than men. Check it out later. We must obey God rather than men. At what point will you, fellow Christian, say, I will go God's way and not men's way? It's an individual thing. You need to make that. At what point will you do it? Are you prepared to do it at all? Because <laughs> I believe that we live in a society where too many Christians are not prepared to do it. Too many Christians have compromised on far too many things, ethically and morally, and just about every single thing. We find explanations and justifications and excuses for everything that we may be like everybody else. And not the people of God. Distinct. And it bugs me and it bothers me. Yeah. 
Let me end by observing what's the time I need to end. Let me end. Everybody's looking at their watch now. It's not so bad. I end by observing and getting excited about the fact that God was with the three of them when they were thrown into the seven times hotter furnace. A lot of what we've been singing this morning is about the presence of God. God was with them. It was seven times hotter. Everybody else got burnt and killed, etc. But the three of them, nothing was touched. They came, went in and came out smelling even sweeter than before they went in. Nothing was touched. And there was this, the look, by the way, there's a lot of speculation about who the, second, the, the fourth person is. I'm not even going to go into that. Uh, I'll just go with a simple explanation that God was with them. There's a whole lot of talk about the pre-incarnate Christ and all that kind of stuff. But hey, if you're into that, go study it and have fun. Knock yourself out. I just know that God was with them uh, in that space. Three became four. I love the fact that they were thrown in all tied up and bound up and everything else. And with God, they were free and set loose. <laughs> Did you notice that? I love that. Little bit of detail there. Just free and walking around. I love that. I love that. The enemy who binds us up and ties us up in a knot and gets the strongest person around to secure us. And uh, with God, they set free to roam, to wander. So I love to something about the presence of God there. God was with them. And I love the fact, as Fumi was saying in her story, that God came through for them. I love the fact that they were saved. They had no idea if they were going to say, but God saved them. God came through for them. One more observation uh, with, uh, with which I'll finish. I love the way that this story uh, says something about standing together. I think Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel when he comes back, I think these guys got encouragement from each other. They did it together. They were doing it together. Just like the two guys on the way to Emmaus, uh, they were there together. I think, hence, I want to encourage you to come on this little walk. Let's go and encourage each other on this ramble uh, on Bank Holiday Monday. But there's encouragement of journeying together, building each other up, supporting each other, encouraging each other. And that's why we have the church on our own. We are weak on our own. We are buffeted, buffeted rather, and we are battered. And we, we can get beaten down, but we need each other. So when we come back on a Sunday, we can be fortified. When we meet midweek, uh, we can be fortified. We can be built up again that we may go back into the world and be who God has called us to be. That's why God has built the church. People of God encouraging and supporting and building each other up. Because on our own, surely but surely, it's going to be far too hard. I know God is with us, but on our, human, on our own, humanly, it is just so much difficult. In Ecclesiastes, it talks about the, the, the importance of having two, does it not? We are better together 